Okay. How you doing? Good. I was just listening to our last session, which was, like, so amazing. Was it? It really was. It's like, it just felt like we got everything kind of, I don't know, we got all the pieces kind of figured out. (laughs) But, um. How have you been since then? So, I've been good. I, um, I figured out shortly after our session that I had, uh, made a small goof with my B12 and I was deficient. So, that's why I was having a hard time moving because I was like probably low on, um, red blood production, mm-hmm. red blood cells or whatever. Um, oh, that's so right. Anyways, you were tired. I, I got you, that fixed. Yeah. I remember you saying you were tired. Okay. Yeah. So I got that fixed. So then it took a couple of weeks, but now I feel pretty much better than I've felt in a long time. So that was great. So, um, anyway, besides that, everything's going pretty good. So after I got that kind of down, um, Everything else has been just kind of trucking along. So, so it did take a little bit of time to recover from that. So after our session, it was took a couple weeks of effort to get kind of back mm-hmm. on track. But I am outside, so I hope it's not going to be too noisy. Okay. No, it's not. So <laughs> overall, um, when was the last time you binged? I haven't. <laughs> Um, I, with food, everything's been really just fine. Did you say binge? Yeah. 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 I used to do that. I know. Um, a lot. Right. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. I really don't. Why do you think, if you were to say, okay, someone was listening to this and they just binged Uh days on end. And they're like miserable and are seeking answers to stop. What would you say? Well, it's definitely about facing whatever is underneath. So. Would you say it's about restricting food? Should they restrict food? No. Right. Yeah. No. And I also think, yeah. From your experience. What, telling you what it means. Yeah. Well, from your experience, what has restricting food, especially food you binge on. Yeah. How did that help? Then you just end up eating and gaining weight. (laughs) Right? It's like a weird, vicious cycle. Yeah. It is. Um, But yeah, I don't, I don't feel the need or any (laughs) restriction around food. Do you feel that you're still obsessing at all about food? What you shouldn't, shouldn't eat? No, I feel like I'm eating just what I want to eat. Um, You know, I like the foods that I eat. I did make a bit of a mistake for a little while, which I had to correct. Luckily, I found out what was the problem, you know, whatnot. But um, What was the mistake? Well, when I, the B12 deficiency... That's not a mistake. Why is that a mistake? Uh, Well, it was just that it impacted my health, but... Yeah, but that's not a mistake. That's not... You didn't do anything wrong. That's not like, oh, a wrongdoing. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know if you see that, like... Yeah, it wasn't really... It was just an oversight kind of thing. Well, are you supposed to be managing, micromanaging your B12? Um, well, if I stay on a vegan diet, I do. <laughs> oh, well, there you yeah, go. So that's what it is. That's what it is. I was. Why are you that doing? Is something you have to do. Yeah, tell me why you're doing vegan. I think you told me this before. I just want to. Well, for a while, I had like. I had really bad issues with constipation and hemorrhoids and just digestive. It was like a nightmare. And then, um, gave up the meat and the dairy over time and figured out I was better that way. Okay. So, so it just kind of became that for me. And then, but I wasn't, that 
was like something that ended up being important uh-huh. that I wasn't thinking about. Um, yeah, no big deal. I mean, that's that's yeah, relevant no, enough, that's you know, and how your body's working. So. Yeah. Yeah, if you are going to go on a vegan diet, you really do need to be on top of that. And that sometimes it takes sometimes it takes having those um, deficiencies and feeling what it feels like to get more in tune to your body too. Yes. You know, to kind of understand what that feels like and so again, I don't think you're making mistakes. I think you're learning. Yeah. I think you're figuring yeah, it out. Something. You're figuring out your body and you're figuring out how this way of eating feels in one direction and what in the other direction, right? There's a compromise. Yeah. You've you've compromised one area to benefit another, and that's pretty much how this type of micro, you know, this type of thing situation works. That's how medicine works. That's how everything works, right? When you're, yeah. you're, uh, you know, it's almost, it's like, okay, we live in an environment where we're, uh, continuously in, um, artificial light. We don't live by the sun and the moon cycle so much anymore. Right. There's compromise to that. You know, yeah. some people have to take a shit ton of B, B vitamin um, D. It doesn't work for me. I have to get in the sun, but you know. Right. Is that a mistake? Right, it is true. It is just learning how to adapt yeah, to small mistake. whatever's what we're living in, how our yeah. lives have been accommodated. <laughs> right, so you'll figure we're it like out. A biological creatures surrounded by technology. <laughs> yeah, so be careful with your language. You haven't made a mistake. You're just learning. Yeah, yeah, because the um, I just found that this works better for me, and you know, my own yeah. sense of well-being. Yeah, and you don't feel deprived. You don't feel. I don't. Yeah. See, so notice how different that is. This is an important conversation. Sorry, I'm eating my breakfast while I'm talking to you. So <laughs> I've got the bagel shoved in my face right now. Yummy. Um, this is the this is a, a conversation. You know, when I talk about Maslow's hierarchy of needs and how sensitive our psychological um, motivation and behavior is to these fundamental needs for survival. And there's, there's a lot of research to show, you know, under different contexts, we respond differently. So in your case, you've removed entire food groups. How is it that you don't have this primitive desire and obsessiveness over dairy and meat? Mm -hmm. You know, whereas if we were to say you can't have bread all of a sudden, bread becomes right. this massive thing you have to focus on and think about and yeah, because when it makes you feel, like, if you notice that it actually makes you feel bad, you develop a distaste almost for it. To yeah. Wear. When it's, it's, just not, it's not a distaste. It's just, I know I don't want that. <laughs> yeah, it's not an emotional it's distortion. Distorted. It's a reality. Right. Yeah, you're not being distorted. Now, when it yeah. comes from a concept, you shouldn't eat that. That's very different, right? You shouldn't right. eat that. That, that's, and that's, like, I want that. <laughs> totally. And they're, they've shown so much uh, science about it. And the idea you shouldn't eat that creates an awareness about what you shouldn't eat. So you're, you're, you're become more and you think about it more often. Mm -hmm. I shouldn't eat that. So you're constantly thinking about it and what that does when you add to that, everybody else is eating it and you want it but I want it, you're just setting yourself up to overeat it. Yeah. Right? When it comes to like, oh, I eat that and I get hives. It's like, right. do I feel deprived by not getting hives, by not eating it? No. Yeah. So the yeah, context for why you're depriving actually can change your, that, that sensitivity to food restriction. Um, mm -hmm. this is why you could say people can fast like spiritual fast and they don't come out of it binge eating. Whereas people who are doing intermittent fasting because they think it'll help them lose weight. Many times they come out of it like, Oh, it's my day. And they start, they're binge eating. They don't see that because they're complementing it with starvation. Mm -hmm. If they're hungry anyways. Yeah, it does feel like once you kind of raise out of that whole 
survival mindset as well. Like, because mm-hmm. for a while I still had like the fruit thing, but now that I've kind of passed that up a bit, the survival mindset, I guess, um, in regards to food, now I'm like, fruit is. <laughs> It's good for me, and I like it, and it's, it works, you know, whatever. And they don't feel bad about it. Something that I, yeah, I don't have this, like, weird record playing that's uh, in the background telling me it's bad or something. Uh-uh. But. It's kind of silly when you think about so, that. Yeah, it really is amazing. <laughs> our whole thing. So. Well, yeah, and once you come out of that, too, doesn't it seem a little weird to demonize food the way people demonize it yeah it's it's funny because it's um it's a funny concept in the sense that it is that is true and then at the same time you can look at like just from a more um I don't know, I want to say moralistic point of view but like should we be putting so much technology in our food or, you know, the like chemicals, all of this type of stuff, whatever. Yeah, well, those or thoughts don't, those thoughts don't come from moral. Food. You know, the difference is those yeah, thoughts don't so. come from shame, 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 shame. It comes from we need to look at it. And the other aspect of it is you're not afraid to die, so let's get realistic. It's like saying uh, people who freaking out about the um, chemtrails. Mm-hmm, right. It's like, yeah, well, I'm going to die. So there is a part of me that goes, well, whatever they're putting in the air, if they are, right? maybe they're helping the climate because the climate is so messed up. Maybe they're trying to create an artificial climate. Mm-hmm. What if that's helping us? But the downside is now we may have things and toxins in our air. I mean, do we really want to micromanage this because we're afraid to die? <laughs> you know, right. so it really comes down to anything that's inflammatory. Well, much of mm-hmm. much of the time can be from perceived fear of death. So, yeah. do you want to focus your life on that, or do you, and and be paranoid, or would you rather just accept that we are living in a time where we're all getting chemically poisoned, and here we go? Right. I know. I've been here recently about the climate change thing and how some of the large corporations are having like these big cry sessions, but everyone's like, "The world's gonna end in ten years or something." <laughs> like, well, you know, we gotta go one way or the other. <laughs> well, there's that. There is that, and then there is what can what can we do? Will you vote? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, we do have to, you know, save our species. <laughs> Anyway, um, yeah, so it's an interesting balance, but once you get out of that survival mindset around food, it does seem like things become a whole lot easier. Right. It's, there's no clutching. There's no desperation. You're not easily panicked. You totally, the fear mongering that's out there, you take (laughs) loosely because it's coming from someone who probably has issues. And they're yeah. distorting it and magnifying it. And they're obsessing over it because they have those issues and you couldn't have compassion for them because you get it. Yeah. But they don't necessarily see it and neither do other people who just believe what they're saying. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah, and I notice I also don't feel the need to, like before I was more defensive or something, but I just see, you recognize it kind of for what it is, you know. Yeah, you don't have to. You don't have to convince someone. You don't have to change someone's thoughts. You can just see their way of being as the way they are in in the moment, and that's not going to change because you're giving them one relaxed state point point of view. Right? Being relaxed to them would be dangerous. Right. Might make sense. So yeah, you. What did it take for you to relax, man? <laughs> Look at that. Like, what did it take for you to get to here? Right. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. And what I think about what it took for me to get to this place. Oh, yeah. it was bad. Do I, you know, so I can, it's like just to, to think that you can convince someone that to relax around food when they're in that state of mind is like, you're not going to convince, they have to convince themselves when they're miserable enough. Right. 
You know, that's why I've had people come to me that want to work with me. They are miserable, but they're not miserable enough. And they want me to convince them to stop doing what they're doing. And I'm like, your misery isn't convincing enough. Then we're, yeah. then what am I going to, it's not my job to convince you to let go of how miserable you are. At some point you got to do it, you know, and that's where you were when you came to me, you were that bad to where yeah. you just listened to what I said, even though it seems radically different. Right. Like you're supposed yeah, to be okay being true. obese. Yeah, you are. You are. How, how else are you going to surrender this? If you can't go into what your fear is threatening you with, you got to go into what your fear is threatening you know, think right. about what your fear was threatening you with when you came to me. Oh, gosh. Yeah. It was definitely like the uh, some kind of demon or something, mm -hmm. uh, you know. That totally. That you're going to be, like, you just, it's this. It's a radical. Maybe, yeah. Your kids are going to all die. They're going to be addicted to heroin. They're going to be addicted to this. You're going to be lose control. No one's going to love you. Your husband's, you're going to be left on the street. You're going to be alone forever. You're going to de be decimated into thin air. You will never exist again. You know, it goes deeper and deeper and deeper into, like, realms of the devil, right? Right. Mm-hmm. That's what, that's what it took for me to say, all right, well, I can't negotiate with that anymore. Right. So right. I'm going to have to, yeah, you like go that. into accepting all of those threats. You're going to be diseased forever. Yes, I accept that because that threat if I can't accept it is why I'm being so crazy trying right. to remove that threat, thinking that that needs to be go, gone away. So I have to go into accepting it and allowing it. And, uh, and then it has no power, right? It becomes a non issue when you're accepting of it. So it's like, you're going to have, um, constipation again with those hemorrhoids, mm -hmm. you know, you kind of go back and forth around what is it worth? Well, and what is it not worth? Like, you will never, ever suffer the way you did again, I trust me. Unless you've made another bargain with the devil, right? <laughs> <laughs> then you will. But in this case, you have the... Right? In this case, you're no longer cognitively distorted. You're like, it's worth the sacrifice. This really isn't... It's tolerable. I don't feel deprived. It's not a big deal. So notice how it's like a nice balance point between what you're willing to do to not have that physical symptom. I had LASIK done. I had horrible eyesight. I had the opportunity. I was a uh, personal training, the wife of the, you know, the surgeon who does them. I got a deal and it was like worth the money. I got, does that mean, you know what I'm saying? If they were to say, oh, you have to go back to your bad eyesight, Robin, if you, uh, because you're going to have, I would just go back to the bad eyes. I mean, there's that balance point. Right. You know, I, yeah. It's not, th that's intellect, right? So, but you can't, you can't access the intellect when you're in survival mode. It just doesn't work that way. Your intellect has been hijacked and is being yeah. run by the survival mechanism. So it's like the way that we got you out. So when we think about, okay, did go back to the binge eating and the kind of hysteria and the paranoia and those symptoms, how did this come out. Well, it took you going into and accepting what you were afraid of. So we did not go to food. The last thing we really talked about was food. I never really talked about food with you. Yeah. We went yeah. right into body image and what yeah. that, what you were clutching onto with your marriage, your self, that concept identity that you had. It wasn't a self identity. It was a concept identity that you'd internalized, right? We had to kind of go into that once you broke that open, what happened to your binge eating issues? Yeah, um, we didn't yeah, have. It all just went away. It just went away naturally because we because right. there was no point to it. Granted, it didn't it didn't happen a hundred percent all at once. You kind of went back into dieting again because you were holding on to health images. Right. right. I still had some lingering ideas or whatever programs that yep. I needed to clear. Yeah. Um, like, a, you got it. Exactly. So, and but you could say that health image wasn't as survival pressurized as the body image from a visible thinness standpoint. Right. And it's funny how when you're in it, your body at whatever weight you're at feels so heavy. 
you're like, oh my god, I can't be at this weight. <laughs> I just, I can't even move my limbs or something. Oh, yeah. And then now I'm, <laughs> it's no, it's just I'm fine. You know? Right. Well, because it's, it's funny you're, now that your mind. Well, because it did it, it your body when you're in that state of mind, it magnifies your whole brain magnifies what you think is the threat. So if we believe, if we were in the wilderness and there is a pack of wolves that we know exists, our brain is going to, it's like a, I call it a danger probe. Think of it like an antenna that's created by what we think we can't handle. So anything you feel, I can't handle that. There's a probe that gets created and it searches that out. There it is. And so you have a danger probe that someone instilled in you because you believed it about body fat. And so your brain, what it's trained to do is a beautiful mechanism. This is an awesome mechanism. This isn't a bad mechanism. It's just trained to magnify the receptiveness. So it's trying to receive information about that threat. Okay. So all of a sudden you become like my fat rolls right here. They're falling, billowing over. That's your fear response. That's not the truth. That's what you're afraid of. And it magnifies your, how it's like putting it under a microscope. It's like it becomes magnified. So you're seeking little tiny details, right? So imagine you're in a wilderness and there's a few packs of wolves out there and your child goes out there. What are you going to do in your brain? It's going to magnify what you need to say to that child. You're going to tell them every single detail of what they need to be thinking about, what they need to be looking about. Are you ready to go? You know, you're micromanaging. That micromanagement is a beautiful thing. It just sucks when it's not associate. It's not attached to a real threat. Okay. Like a, it's yeah. a fake threat. It's an elusive. It's an illusional threat. It's a threat coming from your lack of capacity, not the reality of the environment. When you think about this, this is actually really important. When we think about what is a threat. It's not just the environment that's dangerous. It's also your perception of capacity. Mm -hmm. Right? So think of it. So, okay. We could say, well, it's the truth, whether you like it or not. If you go out in the wilderness and there is a legitimate threat, like I'm in Alaska and it's bear season, you better have a gun. Because the truth of the matter is you're you're, there's predators that are going to come get you. You're, you're delicious, right? You need to have spray. You need to have protection because you are inadequate against a bear. Mm-hmm. Truth, right? Yeah. Imagine how you would feel in that environment without any protection. You would be right. so sensitive to any sounds, like anything would be magnified to receive the environment Mm-hmm. Do you see what I mean by that's amazing? That's a good thing. You better be on your toes. <laughs> yeah, and in a sense, I like that because it is. It kind of validates the, um, like you should be prepared for, like I guess even if it's just a mental preparation. When um, there is a real, you're like, legit, and that goes to <laughs> say, uh, don't forget, it also is a, am I okay if I die? So you can see like, okay, if this person, even if it's a real threat, if they are not okay with death, they're going to be way more kind of obsessive around that preparedness than someone who is accepting of if I die, I die. Yeah. And the other thing, I actually heard this recently, so it's kind of funny you brought it up, but someone else mentioned it as like, if you're a surfer and you're used to eight to 12 foot waves, then uh, when a four foot wave comes, it's no big deal. Someone who's not a surfer tries to do a four foot wave, they're kind of freaking out. So Correct. Yeah. You a sense it kind of, of benefit to you to have had that training, let's say, so that what everybody else is drowning in the four foot wave or whatever, you're still okay. <laughs> totally. <laughs> you kind of remember maybe you'll help them out or whatever, you know, but Yeah, it's like being in yeah. first grade compared to eighth grade. Yeah. Yeah. So you you're just, your sense of capacity is really what you know, it's, it's a combination of what you've experienced and what you're will, what type of risk you're willing to take. Right. Yeah. So when you think about where, when a risk comes up, it's not just, 
that food is dangerous. That's uh, that's like one little tiny slice of the pie. Plus, it's like, well, who's telling you that? And where are you getting that information from? And what is the context of that? And why would they say that? It's quantity dependent because one piece is not that dangerous compared to 50 pieces. So which all or nothing are they? That's cognitive distortion. That's like saying, you know, all wilderness is dangerous. Well, what if I'm in... You see, does that make sense? So what are you supposed yeah. to lock yourself in your home? Right. <laughs> yeah. Yes, they yeah. do. So it's uh, really you have to look at in this, like in your situation with anybody I work with, their their fears are not even close to reality. If I had, so the, if I work with an anorexic, okay, which I have, if I were to say, hey, let's. If you were to, let's move you to a third world environment where you're starving yourself isn't a choice. Same starvation. It's not your choice. And the emaciation around you isn't cool anymore. You're not special. (laughs) What happens to anorexia in that case? It seems like it kind of goes away. It just goes away. It's yeah. relative, right, to wow. what is perceived as a strength and what is perceived as a weakness. And in that environment, it's like it flips around completely. Like you don't look special and you're not. Mm-hmm. Everybody else is in the same boat. It just changes the context. So when we change context, it changes your reaction. So that's essentially what we did. We just didn't yeah. go to a third world environment. What we did, in essence, that was we brought you a first world environment and said food's everywhere. It's everywhere forever. We took your brain out of a third world environment uh-huh. and said you're here in a reality where food is abundant. It's everywhere. It's not going to go anywhere. Yeah. Because we had to get rid of the third world thought process. That thought process came from my body has to be thin. Right. So when we get rid of the thinness, what happened to the third world trigger to food? Starvation. Right. Poof. There was no effort. I didn't have to talk to you about the hunger scale, which is beneficial, but it's benefits a lot of people. And I, and I do talk to people about it, but in your case, it was like, bam, natural. There was no, there's probably a short window of a learning curve, you know? Yeah. Like I even noticed now, I used to always like finish my plate or whatever. There's like this thing about having to eat more than needed or whatever. And I definitely now, just all on my own, I guess, just don't feel that need. <laughs> it's like, okay, I'm good. Yeah, it's not worth the and physical fullness. It's not worth the physical feeling. Anymore. It's that, that dis- decision is no different than you saying, well, if I go back to meat and dairy and the quantities I was eating it before, I'm going to get stopped up. So it's not worth it. So when I, I, when I yeah. eat... Feeling physically ill isn't worth it. So I stop before the plate is empty. And sometimes I need to eat the plate. And then I also need more. So it just depends. Right. It just depends. But like I'm... You know you're full. You're, it's you're, over. You know, you're, yeah. yeah. So the okay. what dictates my quantity of food consumption is a physical satiation. It isn't a mental concept or a visible plate size. Right. Yeah. Yeah, that's amazing, yeah, too, because what does that do to your need for a diet plan? Yeah. Yeah, it's just no, you know, need for that. Doesn't it seem it's, almost like, why would you do that when you have this built-in system? Yeah, it is funny how um, how different life can be once you, like, recover. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, yeah. I still wake up and just with, like... So much gratitude and still almost like my brain is rewiring to understand that I made this change. And I'm like, oh my God, my life is so much better. Like, I can't believe I'm waking up Mm -hmm. in this life. And it's like every day is just. I feel the same way. And it's been over 20 years. It's been 20 years for me and I have the same feelings. Oh my God. I am so grateful. I mean, it's. Right. And you'll never forget that misery. It's almost like burned into your like, okay, I'll never do that again. Cause it is a choice. Yeah. It's a choice. It is. You might not know it when you're, yeah. mi- when you're in the misery, it doesn't, you can't see that choice. Right. Because you're just, 
you're kind of stuck in those in those uh, kind of mechanisms. Yeah. Kind of like you make the deal with the devil where you were unconscious when you made it. Totally. Today, you really have no idea. You don't <laughs> until you're until you're suffering enough and you're desperate. And you and, and not only that, but you ask for help. Yeah, right. right so it yeah. takes that. You know, once someone says, I need help, it's all, it's like, oh, you're getting close. <laughs> yeah. That means that your know-it-all self in there is saying, I really don't know what I'm doing. Yeah. <laughs> white flag. I can remember the white flag. Totally. Where you're just like, I can't do it anymore. Because you can tell you're losing your grip on reality. I mean, you lost it a long time ago, but you could manage it, manage it, manage it. And eventually you can't even manage your own system. Yeah. Oh, oh God. I know. I always feel so bad when people come to me because I kind of, I'm like, oh, I, I, I have to I have compassion, but it's like, you want out, here's the way out, and we'll talk about it. We can talk about it for, like, 20 sessions. That's fine. Mm-hmm. When you're ready, you'll take it. It'll take two seconds. It's literally like, boom. You, it's like a snap of the finger for many people. Some people, yeah. they take to one foot out, one back in, one foot out, one back in, one foot out, and finally they're just like, screw it, and they jump, and it's over. It's yeah. crazy, and the brain completely just goes in this whole, this way of existing, the way you're existing, is normal. That's how the brain should function, period, when there's no actual real threat. Yeah. This is what your life should be like. This is how your children should be existing. Yeah, it really is. Right? It's like reserve that, that, those mechanisms when they're beneficial. Mm-hmm. Right? When you're in the wilderness without a gun. <laughs> right. <laughs> When something cataclysmic happens and you need to, you need to get some access to food in a way to get more food. That's when this becomes very important. Why are we doing it in a first world environment? Why are we living in a third world brain in a first world environment? Well, it's because you have to be thin, you know, it's amazing to me how, how you can go from such severity, right? You could, could, you could have been diagnosed with so many different things. Have you been diagnosed before from a psych- psychiatrist? Like with no, bipolar or depression? Or... Depression. I have been diagnosed with depression before. But yeah. That was a long time ago. Like over 10 years or so. 15 years or something. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. It's, it's amazing to me how when people are ready. And the thing is this. You really have to give up permanently the concept of thinnerness and this concept of what health is. You have to surrender it if you want the freedom. I've had clients who've gotten temporary, like real, they, 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 they give it up temporarily, which means they have a temporary constrained freedom. It's still better than what they had before, right? Relative to what they had before, it's like so much better. However, They don't really, really get it. And they always cycle back into the dysfunctional behavior because they're not willing to give it up. They're only willing to give it up for a little bit, kind of, maybe. So they want the freedom, but they still want the thinness. And they just sit in this holding pattern, right? I think I did that probably for a few weeks during our sessions. Yeah. Because I did all of a sudden like start eating healthy or whatever. And then, of course, I like gained more weight. And then I realized like it's time to give up. Let it go. Yes, you know. Yeah. And then I made the, the switch. So, like, yeah, you can see how you were trying to hold on to something that keep you safe. Yeah. It's like, okay, I'm going to go out in the wilderness, Robin, which to you was food. But I'm going to hold on to a couple shields. I'm just going to, because I don't, I can't really fully handle it. If I can keep this, that's good, right? Like, it's healthy, right? Mm-hmm. And I think it's just those programs that haven't, like, I guess, yeah, it takes a little while to knock out some of the big ones. Or whatever. Well, especially the ones that are the biggest, the wolves in sheep's clothing. Yeah. It's so healthy. Like, you, it's easy to see thin supremacy as a, that is really gross, right? You can see that as like, oh shit, like that's obviously needs to go. My worth is not defined by my sexual attractiveness. Whereas I need to do this for health may not be as obvious. Right. Again, the wolf in sheep's clothing. That's your survival mechanism hiding behind some kind of health concept. 
Yeah, and then it's different too. It seems like if it's health, but you don't even have any sort of chronic illness or something, and then someone who has cancer, let's say, and now they want to actually maybe try to reverse their their symptoms or whatever. Yeah, and, and that's it's assuming not the same like no. narcissistic. Thing. No, it's not. And I will tell you this: anybody who has that is very loose around what they expect out of those. And the, unless they really are mentally ill ahead of time and are still. Yeah, right. Right. I had uh, my, oh, Heidi was a doctor I worked with who, um, she was awesome. I loved her so much. She was amazing. And she ended up with sinus cancer and was so bitter about the medical community and the pharmaceutical that she basically let herself die. She had two teenage kids. She did nothing. She went, she went around and did some natural things and she flew around the world to be to healers and stuff like that. Um, and she died within five months of diagnosis, um, wow. because she was so angry. Right. So, uh, and I remember she was, we, she had called me and the last time I talked to her, I was like, you need to write, you need to focus on your children. Cause I could, she was like, I might, I can't breathe through my nose. I've got blood coming out of my ears, blah, 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 whatever it was. Yeah. And I just remember thinking, Oh honey, you need to start your exit strategy. And she, she could hear it. Uh-huh. <gasps> oh my God. And so I was like, you need to write letters to your girls. You need to start planning your, your, it was a moment like, Oh, death is right here. She couldn't give up her, her fight with this concept of anger until the very end when she had hardly any time and she died like 10 days later. Yeah. So you could look at that and go, Oh, she didn't get it until the very end. Like, Oh, Oh my God. What have I been doing? Yeah. You know, and that's okay. You know, what does it take for someone? Well, I'm not going to judge that. Yeah. Yeah, so, yeah. You're I right. feel really compassionate towards anybody who's struggling with whatever. And then on top of that, like health stuff, cancer, all this kind of stuff. It's like a double whammy because you don't have your brain right yet. Your uh, intellect's back. You know, you've been hijacked or whatever. And yeah. Now you have this other thing. Yeah, and then most of the time people who are in that state become martyrs. Do you see how that's just like, oh, God, how are you going to get out of that unless you you got to snap out of it? You need to see reality. And that's and a lot of people do. A lot of people, it changes them permanently yeah. to have an actual threat to death. It makes their reality like, oh, this is not a real threat. Why would I care about those stupid things? And it can change you. Yeah. Some people, it just, they don't evolve as quickly. But anyways, you're right. So someone is involved might go into changing those things that they, like I have a friend who had stage three breast cancer. She literally doesn't give a flying shit about the, the whole food thing. Like she used to be way more concerned. Her mom is always sending her shit. She's like, why would I waste my life on that? I'm like, I know you're talking, preaching the choir. Like I wouldn't either. Yeah. Yeah. She's been cancer free for, I don't know, 13, 14 years. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it is definitely just there's so many ways to kind of look at it as far as, um, you know, I like how you said about the hijacking of the mind and really that's where it's all kind of at and, mm-hmm. and with food and um, yeah. And there is just, it's amazing to me. Well, I've been there, so I kind of get it right. It's kind of, it's all in your face. One of the ways I describe it in, in the book, uh, that was going to be published here, hopefully in the next couple months is it's like your brain, you have goggles on that magnify food anywhere you go. Food is, it's like super hyper magnified and you're, yeah. And your response when you eat it is emotionally magnified. I remember 
feeling like, why doesn't anybody, everybody else, they look, they're eating pizza and there's nothing. They're, they're thinking about other things. They're having these conversations, but I'm obsessed right now. And I'm, I'm having a panic attack because I had some pizza. I'm literally trying to formulate a way how to puke it up mm -hmm. because I'm so distraught about it. But yet, how are they so free to just be like, they don't have to be so upset about it. And I just didn't understand why. I never connected the dots to my desire to be thin. Right. No, why right. would you question that? That's honorable. Yeah. This is why I think it's termed wrong. You're calling it an eating disorder. This isn't an eating disorder. This is a body image problem. Yeah. It just projects into food. Yeah. Anyways, oh my god. I can see how it would be one of the most difficult, um, because isn't it like one of the most deadly disorders uh -huh. or whatnot? I yeah. can see how it would be since food is so crucial to life and then it's like your brain becomes hijacked with all these crazy programs, so now... Yeah, food is your threat. Food is the bear. Yeah, so it's like food is so, so important, but yet you're being told by an industry that food is toxic. Food is bad. You shouldn't eat it. It's going to kill you. It causes cancer. Right. And that alone, you just hear that alone. It's like, well, no shit. You're going to have eating problems. Yeah. Underneath that is because in order for you to be lovable and accepted, you need to be thinner and healthy. Yeah. Yeah. I know another change I noticed was, um, like, if I go meet new people, let's just say, before I would have felt like, oh, I need to get thinner before I would do something like that. But now it's, like, not even an issue. Right? Could you imagine? I think about it when I go and just talk to people, and, and that's it. And then, that's so and, huge. But I remember when I used to feel like I couldn't do that. So, oh, that's yeah. a big deal, what you just described. Yeah. Because why can you see now it's like, well, you're just going to meet they're going to meet you. They're not going to meet a thin body. A hollow. Right. Don't forget a hollow, miserable thin body. Because yeah. you're hollow. There's no realness in that. It's just some visual concept of what you want them to think you are. Versus who are you really? What are you presenting to people? Right. Yeah, now you get to actually just have actually a true uh, essence of a person who can talk. <laughs> no, it, no it, it's like being free. That, what you're describing is recovery. Like that right there. Yeah. That Doesn't that just seem like that would have been a fantasy of yours before? Like, yeah. oh. And you probably thought, when I'm thinner, I'll get that. Right, right. When I'm thin, I'll be a real person. Yeah, and the irony is that. <laughs> when you're thin, you're Every hollow. <laughs> When you're yeah. thin, you're not even, you don't even exist. Your thinness exists, not you. Yeah, it is. It's so sad. I hope everybody <laughs> recovers from this. Well, they will when they're ready. Yeah. I do think that education is a big part of it. I do, too. Yeah, people actually talking about it more. Yeah, for but me. It's not out there, and if you're in the dark... You, you just don't even see, you know. No, you're not questioning the dogma. You're not no. questioning the diet industry. You're not questioning all the health righteous shit that's out there right now. You don't question any of it. You just take yeah. it as fact. And you're not realizing that you're getting as distorted as the facts that they're giving you. That fact right. was distorted. You're now distorted because you believe it 100%. So if they tell you that gluten is toxic, you're going to be that distorted. Mm hmm that's pretty dang distorted. You know, they don't, they're not. So that's why you've got to keep it. That's the, that's like, you got to keep a little distance. Yeah. You got to wear a lot of this information with a loose glove, like a loose, loose, loose glove. Yeah. Yeah. I did notice that I definitely started looking at things like that. Like, yeah. <laughs> if you don't know who paid who for that research, you know, because they put the thumb on the scale, of course, if they want the research to tilt. And then now they have some new trend that they're going to promote propaganda by their supplies. You know, I don't know. Seems like it all kind of goes hand in hand. Uh-huh. Yeah. I typically, when you look at, when you look at research, you want to look at research coming out of the universities, not some lab. 
Right. Yeah, so. Because yeah. when you're looking at research coming from a lab, you're looking at what they won't want to see. And they'll tilt it because they want to make money and they want to sell a product that's paying actually for that lab's fee. So you're correct. They're always going to, and they'll take one study and they will omit all 50 other ones that are showing a variety of results, not just one result, right? Right. Because whoever, you know, funded the study morally was hoping for it to go that way or something. Well, they already have a product they want to sell, right? Yeah. Yeah. So that whole thing, they don't tell people about that. No. Mm -mm. That's been going on since. It's been going on since World War II, since after World War II. With the height and weight chart. That's what the height and weight chart was. Okay. That was the insurance company wanting to sell some concept of your disease. If you're a health, un, the first, first time unhealthy weight was introduced. Oh, okay. Hmm. Which made also healthy weight. It made, it was made this kind of black divide line between you're healthy, you're not healthy. So people before who felt great, who had no symptoms whatsoever, all of a sudden they stepped on a scale and got their height measured and they were told you're unhealthy right just some random concept yeah and, and how it, is a person gonna feel when you're being told that and now your belief system is going to either accept it or reject it and most people right you give your authority away yep to that person who says you need to now lose weight even though you're there's no symptoms whatsoever and right. you have this so like right <laughs> yeah and they're, they're they like stamp on your body diseased so it became a stigma unhealthy right. weight and it was a visible thing people could see oh she's overweight oh she's unhealthy yeah. which is like so not actually accurate the more weight someone has the healthier they get up until morbid obesity There's so many so much science to show that even if you're yeah. overweight you're healthier than someone who's underweight I don't like that, Robin. <laughs> well, it's 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 factual, and this has been this actually is really funny because this has been known for centuries. When there was disease, wow. people who have higher fat sources survive longer than those who are thinner. So prior to the you know um, pharmaceutical explosion with antibiotics, and um, there was more disease, there was more death. Yeah. So they wanted body fat on you. You need to be, because it prevented the, the idea prior to the turn of the century in the 1940s after World War II was you needed fat on your body. Because mm -hmm. if you get sick, it's going to preserve your life. All these thinner people are dying. So thinnerness was stigmatized as disease prone. You can imagine if there's a plague or something, the thinner people, which are usually the poverty, working class, um, they had more death rates. Yeah. So can you imagine, you can see that the thinnerness might be associated to mental illness as well. Yeah. Because you're dealing with it's death. Just lack, you're right? dealing with trauma. Yeah. So for a long time, being thinner was stigmatized as disease prone, mental illness issues so it was reverse being thinner being fatter was a sign of health i'm happy i'm safe and secure yeah that's really interesting yeah world war ii post world war ii really fucked us up you're diseased and you need to buy insurance and after yeah. world war ii as well people just it was all about camaraderie and you do what you're told so no one ever, no one questioned it. And the medical community got a lot of power out of that. Yeah. Crazy. Yeah, we're still recovering from it today. Yeah. But we also have this mega industry that's selling the, those, like, old concepts. And they're making a shit ton of money. Fat shaming, health shaming, right. you know, disease exactly. shaming, you know, the whole idea, like type 2 diabetes might as well be a stigma. Oh my God, you can prevent that. What's wrong with you? You're just binging your brains out. What are you eating candy all the time? Uh -huh. Which in reality, you're more likely to have diabetes if you're thin and sedentary and stressed out. Uh -huh. 
government. <laughs> well, it's not the government so much as it is you're the consumer. You're consuming this shit. So we can sit here yeah. and tell the government this, but the reality is you've given your authority away. You consume right. it. You believe that crap. And someone who's in survival mode is going to believe that, especially when you don't question the authority. Mm-hmm. So you just have to not buy into it. Right, right. And in the end, you'd have to be okay with, with death. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. easy, right? <laughs> Wait, what is the last thing you said? I said it's so easy, right? So easy. Oh, it's just so easy to escape all the chaos. Oh, wait, through it. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. Don't worry, it gets better on the other side. <laughs> oh, so crazy. Yeah. So I'm like, you know what? I'm going to die. I'm going to die sooner or later. So I'm going to relax and enjoy my life. If there's yeah. something that's obviously preventable, I'll do it. Mm-hmm. Um, but I'm not going to sit here and worry. Am I going to get cancer? What if I do? Right. I just hope there's a right to die. If I am if I do get cancer, I'm moving to a right to die state. That's for sure. Yeah. 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 I, I like that too. That's just me though. I just watched yeah. my mom die terribly and I'd rather not go through that. Yeah. I've always felt that too. I didn't know they had states like that. Yeah, Washington State, Oregon State. You got to go to the Pacific okay. Northwest. Okay. There might be some other, I don't know, if Canada or I don't know. Yeah, because once it starts going too far. Right. Well, they're just going to pump you up with morphine, and then you're not going to be coherent. Yeah. Anyways, uh, that's a whole other topic. Uh, um. All right, Melanie. Well. So- but yeah, so everything's up. Uh-